Hi, I'm Father Mitch Paquin. Tonight on EWTN Live, we'll talk about the church's liturgy and how it affects the uh, belief of our members. But before we get to that, we want to talk a little bit about EWTN Radio and how it can affect the belief of its listeners. And for that, we want to welcome the to our set here, the general manager of EWTN Radio, Mr. Jack Williams, who's also my sidekick on radio this afternoon. I've been promoted to sidekick. I like that. <laughs> Maybe you're the boss. Uh, well, so know, what's... <laughs> well, you know, listen, in order for people's beliefs to be affected by radio, we got to have people listening to radio. Yes, and I just want to make sure that everybody knows where they can find it. Mm -hmm. The best thing they can do is go to EWTN.com, and across the top navigation bar, they'll find a radio tab. So click on that, they'll get a little pull-down menu. One of the things that that'll do for them is it'll give them uh, access to a map that will show them where all of the 380 e, uh, AM, FM radio affiliates are mm -hmm. around the country that mm -hmm. carry our programming, mm -hmm. so they can see if there's an AM, FM affiliate in their area. Yep. If there isn't, they can listen online by going to the same tab. They can listen in English, they can listen in Spanish, and they can also listen to EWTN Radio Classics which is our teachings and devotionals channel. Mm -hmm. There you go. So they have all that on uh, the, the Internet site. At EWTN.com. Uh, EWTN.com. Great place and lots of other good information there, too, and our document mm -hmm. library, et cetera. So Absolutely. go there and find out about radio. Check it out. Well, thank, thanks, Jack. Appreciate yes, you coming here. And uh, to find that affiliate near, just go online again, EWTN.com slash radio. Now, we'll be back in 30 seconds with tonight's guest, so please stay with us. Well, thank you. As we continue on with EWTN Live, uh, we have a guest tonight who is working to bring about continuing renewal in the church through a resurgent of its f sacred traditions. Now, he's a professor of theology and philosophy at Wyoming Catholic College in Lander, Wyoming. And he's also the author of a book. It's called Resurgent in the Midst of Crisis, Sacred Liturgy, the Traditional Latin Mass, and Renewal in the Church. So please welcome our guest tonight, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. <laughs> Doctor. Now you live in Lander, correct? Yes. Exactly. How long have you been at Wyoming? 11 years. 11 years teaching at Wyoming. And you've taught before uh, at other institutions, but you've, it's just, what, your longest uh, uh, teaching uh, job? Yes, teaching that's post? correct. I, yeah. I taught before that in Austria at the International Theological Institute. Yeah, yeah, the, in Gaming. In Gaming. That's, that's associated with um, Franciscan. They, 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 they share field, a campus. Yeah, they share a campus exactly. over there. Exactly. Great. Yeah, that's a good, good, very fine school. I've had students I know who go there. And I don't think about Wyoming and Gregorian chant. I think cowboy songs. I'm thinking of listening to yippee yi kai yo get along little doggies. What are you doing with Latin chant and such over in the great state of Wyoming? Uh, <clears throat> I have certainly nothing against all those cowboy songs around Good. the campfire. Well, then uh, you can stay on for the rest of the show. Yes. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but in our chapel, in our chapel we use Gregorian chant, uh, also polyphony, classic hymnody. Um, and uh, I'm the choir director there as well. So it's very important to us to take seriously um, what all the popes, Pius X onwards, and, and the Second Vatican Council have taught about sacred music. That's a, that's a really important part of our whole yeah. curriculum and our whole program. Well, it, it, it's not only, but Vatican II also. Mm -hmm. You know, the Vatican Council was very clear and strong on the importance of the beauty of the liturgy and the use of chant and um, uh, the, the use of Latin as well. Exactly. It's, it's a surprise to a lot of Catholics that the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium from 
December 1963. That was the uh, very first, the first document yes. of Vatican II. The first of the 16, uh, which uh, later on uh, Joseph Ratzinger said was symbolic because they wanted to put the worship of God first and give it first place. Yeah. Uh, but in that constitution, uh, the Council Fathers, over 2,000 of them, voted that Latin should remain the language of the liturgy. In the for, Roman Rite. Yes, in the Roman Rite, both mm -hmm. for the Divine Office and for the Mass. Uh, and also that Gregorian chant should have pride of place or chief place. Um, and unfortunately, I, th I think we've, we've seen um, in the intervening decades that, that those words have been uh, more observed in the breach, uh, that they have, they have not actually been implemented. You no, know. as a matter of fact, what a lot of folks, you know, uh, obviously Pope St. John the Twenty Third is so much beloved. He was so much beloved while he was Patriarch of Venice and, and Pope. You know, I remember him quite well, uh, you know, from the, the news and everybody just loved him. But what they also don't remember is that one of his early encyclicals was on insisting that seminaries and seminarians uh, teach and learn Latin. That's right, uh, that's right. And, so, and that affected my high school seminary. We, uh, they had a brand new program so that we could learn to speak Latin as well as, uh, you mm -hmm. know, read, you know, the classics. Yes, and, and in fact, I should mention, just because I think it's, it's quite intriguing, that at our college, uh, we, we, the freshmen and sophomores take two years of spoken Latin. It's a, it's a full immersion course into mm -hmm. Latin, yeah. um, precisely because we, we recognize that if you're going to revive the language of Holy Mother Church, uh, it needs to be revived as a language that you can understand, that you can really get into, you can appreciate it. And um, even yeah. think in a bit. Yes, or dream in it. Some of the students yeah. start to dream in it. It's good. It's good. Um, yeah. Actually, I hope they're not dreaming of becoming emperors or anything. <laughs> it's probably not the right time for that. No, no. The, um, uh, but, but so th this is th this love of Latin in the church is not something that we ought to think of as just being dumped. It's not mm -hmm. excess color. This is not the Boston Tea uh, Party mm -hmm. where you just dump it into the sea. It's something that the Vatican Council, Pope St. John the Twenty Third, and and others have talked about, but it, it's not done so much. What are you doing to try to bring about uh, an integration of Latin in the liturgy? Mm -hmm. uh, I think what's, what's important first is, is simply to recognize why it's important to have any Latin in the liturgy, mm -hmm. um, because certainly in a lot of places, Latin has disappeared, yeah. and, and, and Catholics are not um, in daily contact with it or weekly contact with it. Uh, but I think it's important for the reasons John Twenty-Third gives. He says that the liturgy of the church as well as her dogmatic statements and her canon law should be in a language that's stable, uh, clear, noble, and has a great heritage behind it, a, a, a kind of heritage of, of meaning and consistency. Mm -hmm. um, and so especially in the liturgy, the language ought to be a noble, sacral, uh, transcendent um, phenomenon, something that when you, when you come up against it, it doesn't seem like the ordinary world to you. It doesn't seem like uh, the marketplace. It doesn't seem like what you're going to, to, to talk to your neighbor in. Um, when, and in a way, um, I think that the Latin language is, is almost like a sonic iconostasis that is uh, in the Byzantine what you, churches. Wait, what do you yeah, mean yeah. by sonic iconostasis? Sure, let me, just, so Explain it, yourself. If, if you go into a Byzantine church um, and, or an Eastern Orthodox church, you'll see a beautiful array of panel icons um, separating the sanctuary from the nave of the church. And it, it always impresses people because it, it, it tells you immediately, I'm in a sacred place, and there's a separation of the Holy of Holies from the rest of the space, just as there was in the Temple of Jerusalem. Right, um, so the, the church is a sacred space. Exactly. It's not a place for meetings and such as that. Precisely. But then with the iconostasis, which is icons all, um, always of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes Pantocrat or Almighty, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary on the other side, and then various saints, maybe a patron mm -hmm. saint of the church, Saint John the Baptist is Papa, Saint Michael, Saint Gabriel, the archangels. They're, they're, those are, pop, but it's to give you a sense, they're heavenly beings, and you are going even deeper into heaven itself exactly. as you get into the liturgy. Yes, and so I think in, in the Western tradition, 
um, for a variety of reasons, fairly complex reasons. We never developed an iconostasis. Sometimes there was a rude screen with the crucifix and Our Lady and St. John. But for the most part, if you walk into a Catholic church, there isn't a, a physical barrier or a separation that says, okay, now we're on holy ground and what we are transacting here is a holy commerce, a holy exchange. But the Latin language, as it developed over many centuries and ceased to be the common vernacular language, it acquired that kind of numinous religious quality to it. So that when you began, when you heard the chant of the mass began, begin in Latin, or when you heard the priest doing a reading in Latin, you knew that this was a language that had become consecrated and set apart for God mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why I call it a sonic iconostasis. It's a kind of separation from the secular And by sonic, world. you mean it's a sound. Yes, icon, yes. It's a, an icon in, of sound. Yes, sure exactly. You know, we in in the, you know by ritual in the Maronite rite, and there we uh, sometimes speak of the um, use of Aramaic, which mm. you know is a little bit older than Latin. I mean, Latin is only an Iron Age language. I mean, <laughs> you know, at least we're going back to the Bronze Age languages. <laughs> but one of the things about this is if we think of it as um, verbal uh, ar uh, archaeology, mm. you know, we're, we're Keep staying rooted mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the words of Christ, even by the sounds and, 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 and words. So that's something that's uh, another way of getting at that. Yes. And, you know, there's, there's another element, too, is that um, you can have uh, Latin as something that go, it gets used all around the world. That's one of the reasons we yes. use some Latin in our masses, our mass from EWTN goes around the world. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's true. In, in fact, there are some Vatican documents that that strongly encourage the use of Latin, especially for international assemblies. Mm -hmm. I, I have to admit, sometimes it's it's. It, it, it can be a bit absurd if you see at international gatherings the, the general intercessions or prayer of the faithful being recited in 10 different languages, one after, after mm -hmm. the next. Yeah. When, when if we had a common, and we do have a common Catholic language, if we used our common Catholic language, then nobody would be alienated for, for the, precisely for the reason that Latin isn't the language of any country. It's not the language of a nation or a people right. anymore. It's just the language of the Catholic Church. Right. Um, so wherever I travel in the world, it's very comforting to me when I can find a traditional Latin mass. Uh, if I'm in France or Germany or England or wherever I happen to be, uh, if I'm traveling for, for there for, to give a lecture or something, I go into the church and the chant of the mass begins and I know exactly where I am. I'm at home. I'm mm -hmm. at home right. in the Roman rite and, right. and it's common to all of us. So it seems a bit ironic to me that in an era where people are traveling more than ever, um, the vernacular was so exalted, it would have made more sense. Especially By in vernacular, era of, you mean the, the uh, language that we speak today, yeah, the, the everyday, modern languages. Right. I mean, it, it, it seems that, that now more than ever with literacy, as well as with travel, that one common language for worship would, would, would just make sense, uh, mm -hmm. in addition to its symbolic and historical uh, weight. Right. Yeah. But it's, you know, be that as it may, you know, we, we probably won't, you know, I, I don't see major movement to have the majority of the mass in Latin, mm. but you know, we do have you know, opportunities to have some of the most, com what we call the common parts or the commons. Yes. You know, these are well known. Mm. I mean, Protestants composed fantastically beautiful masses in the, those languages. Bach was exactly. a Lutheran, but he used the Latin Mm -hmm. settings for his masses. Yes. Uh, and we can we can still use those. There's a parish in Chicago, St. John Cantius, that uses some of those mass settings. It didn't matter if they were Catholic or not. Mm -hmm. The composers used it because of the not only the common language, but there also was a poetic yes. quality to it. Yes. And and meter. You you asked a moment ago, um, uh, how can we integrate Latin back into the ordinary form? Because of course, I mean, with the extraordinary form, it's it's in Latin automatically. That's that's right. the only way it's ever right. been. Right. But with the ordinary form, um, I think I think what you're saying is exactly right. Uh, one should start with the ordinary of the mass or the common parts of the mass: the Gloria, the Sanctus, the Credo, the Agnus Dei, the Pater Noster, the Lord's mm -hmm. Prayer. Because these never change; they're the same from week to week, all year that's round, right. um, right. and everybody can learn them. And that's actually what the Second Vatican Council said too: the parts of the mass that remain fixed and unchanging should should remain in Latin, and the parts of the mass that change from day to day uh, can be in the vernacular. That's, that's right. That's how the council that, put it. You know, so there's some of the prayers. That, 
most Americans uh, and most people around the world would not know what you're saying if you did, say, the collects, mm -hmm. you know, those mm -hmm. individual prayers that change every day or every week. Mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't understand that. Yes. But any one of us can follow along the, the Gloria mm -hmm. or the, the Agnus Dei or the mm -hmm. Sanctus. Yes. And that's what we have. With, with books, you can get books with exactly. English next to the Latin and follow along. Yes. And, and the other thing one sees too, uh, and any educator um, who's worked with, with children will know this, um, children have no fear of the unknown and of learning uh, new things and even things that we consider difficult. I, I've taught Gregorian chant to many children, beginning with my own, mm -hmm. and at the age of six, seven, eight, they can already be singing the Salve Regina and they can know that it's a prayer to Our Lady. And that, that's perhaps at that age, that's all they need to know. Mm -hmm. And as they grow into it over time, uh, they, they, they grow to understand more and more what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like gradually unwrapping this wonderful gift. And you don't, you know, we, we, we don't like it when people unwrap a present so quickly and they look at it and then they just toss it aside. We, we consider that ungrateful. Our, our faith is like, is like uh, this immense 2,000 year old or even longer uh, uh, tradition. And we unwrap it over our whole lifetimes. We have to keep seeing into it. And I think Latin is that way. It's, it, both, it, it both reveals the sacred and it, and it veils in a way, it, it covers over the mystery and it makes us um, work harder to penetrate into it. I think sometimes the, the common language, the vernacular, let's say English in our case, when we worship in that common language, um, it, can, it can go in one ear and out the other more easily because it's our everyday language. We take it for granted. You know, it's like a fish in water. Um, and, and I think with Latin, sometimes we come up against that. There's a kind of barrier there. And I think that's, that's helpful for us psychologically. I, you know, I was in eighth grade when the council started and was in, uh, it continued on through into my high school years. And that means that growing up, we did mass, all, all the mass was in Latin. And from fourth grade on, when, as I could read bigger words and such, I had a missal, had the English and had the Latin uh, side by side on the pages. Mm -hmm. And we, it was just very normal yes. for us to read the Latin and see the and check the English, and that's, that's how I started learning yes. Latin vocabulary. Yes, yeah, Joseph Rotzinger has a beautiful passage in his autobiography, also known as Pope Benedict XVI. Yes. So the Pope so for, not everybody remembers. Yes, uh, he has he has this autobiography called Milestones, which I highly recommend, um, and it, it's not a it, it's a biography that stops uh, around the time of his arrival in Rome as prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. But he talks about how special it was growing up in Bavaria. Uh, how he would receive every couple of years a new missal, that it was, the, it was at the next highest level, as you were saying. Right. right? So he, he first received the really small children's missal with the picture that says, see, Father, go up to the altar. He's praying to God for us. Yeah. And then the next one was uh, the Gospels were in there as well as the pictures. And then the one after that had all the prayers. And he said it was like being slowly initiated into this great family heritage and, right. and being taught more and more of the the good secrets of your family, right? You know, the, the being shown um, this, this remarkable uh, treasure chest that the church has. One of the issues at stake, and, and this, this is where the tension lies. There, there is a tension mm -hmm. between using Latin and using the English or other vernacular languages. Even the Latin liturgy, you know, that was a crisis in the third century. Mm -hmm. I believe that helped provoke the first anti-pope Mm -hmm. uh, St. Hippolytus, who mm -hmm. became a saint because he was a martyr. Uh, if they hadn't killed him, they'd probably just consi consider him a schismatic. But he said, we've never celebrated the Mass in Latin. Yes. The Mass was in Greek. Yes, that's true. <laughs> and our Eucharistic prayer number two is by him. It was a Greek mm -hmm. composition. And it, it, it's important to know that it was a long transition mm -hmm. from Greek into Latin. It took about a hundred years or so mm -hmm. before the translation was finalized. Yes. But as we deal with that transition into better English translations and still keeping some of the Latin, um, we want to have this understanding so we can comprehend, but we also want and need even if we don't want it, but we need to have our minds elevated. I you know to lift up my mind to the Lord. And the tension 
that I see is too often the hymns that we use and the settings we do kind of mm. tamp down. They're not beautiful. Yes. yes. They don't elevate us. They sort of make the mass, you know, sort of comfortable. Lottie, yeah. you know, and they're not real. Not, uh, you know, some of the music is horrible mm -hmm. uh, in its words. Yes. Yes. And it's radical even. Yes. And uh, at other times it's, um, you know, it's just not elevating. So we have to have that tension between lifting us up but also understanding. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what we're trying, I think, to deal with. Uh, I mean, in, in the realm of sacred music, um, I think the most unfortunate development there was it was a particular case of a larger problem that I that I that one could call accommodationism. Mm -hmm. That is the mentality that the church, the business of the church in the modern world, is to accommodate herself more and more to modern man or secular society or the surrounding contemporary art forms. Um, in the in the in the mistaken belief, I, I think it was perhaps naive in the 1960s. Now it's downright um, absurd to think this, but but there was a mistaken belief that if only we could start taking on the forms of expression of the secular world, we would suddenly appeal to them and we'd have all these new avenues of evangelization. Mm -hmm. And what happened was the dilution of the Christian message and of the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. it, we, we ended up taking on the character of the world rather than the world taking on the character of the church. Right. Uh, and, and I think we can see now more clearly, if Catholics don't preserve their own identity through something like Gregorian chant, what is it in the end that we have to offer to the secular world? They can do secular things better than we can. They'll always beat us at their own game. right? Yeah, no, they, they get a lot more enthusiast, enthusiasm at secular concerts mm -hmm. than we would get with the Catholic music that sort of sounds like secular yes. music but isn't as good. I, I once heard a, a statement that um, uh, a Christian rock song is relevant for only three, three minutes and two and a half of them were not worth it. Yeah, um, yes. you have to be careful yeah. about, you know, which, but whereas, again, the notion that the liturgy should be bringing us into the heavenly mm -hmm. and getting us somewhat beyond the everyday. Yes. yes. See, that's, that's another one of the tensions. Do we bring the liturgy down to our level? Mm -hmm. Or do we let the liturgy raise our level up to God's? Right. Well, I mean, there, in a way, I think it's a problem when, when, when people try to answer these questions in the abstract. They, ha they actually have to look to and trust church tradition. Every, every ecclesiastical tradition, Eastern and Western, has a sacred chant. Mm -hmm. You can see this in Absolutely. every type of Byzantine or, or Eastern church, and it's also the case with the, with the Roman church. We have mm -hmm. our own special chant that developed slowly. Um, it, 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 it evolved in this wonderful organic way over a period of a thousand years. The heritage of Gregorian chant that we have, it, it begins, it's already being sung in the time of Pope St. Gregory the Great, who died in, 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 in uh, 604, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so the chant is already there. I mean, he inherits it. And then it, it's, it, the chants continue to be written into the early Middle Ages. Roughly around 1200 is when most of the chants are finished. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at this immense... Um, heritage of sacred music, and, and it was never questioned. This was bone of its bone, flesh of its flesh, of the Roman rites. You know, this music wasn't just an add-on. It wasn't like a, a cantor in, in, in 800 AD said, well, I could choose this hymn or this hymn or this chant or this style of music or that style. He had the chant of the liturgy, and it was already there for him, and he just sang what was there, um, or added to it if, if need be, if there was a new feast like Corpus Christi. Well, then they write new chants for that, but always in the style of the old chants. So this, this principle of tradition um, is, I think, the most important principle for answering questions like, should, should the liturgy be lifting us up to the heavenly realm, or should it be, so to speak, condescending to our level? Well, the, the history of the church, East and West, has always answered that question in one way, which is it should be lifting us up to a participation right. in the heavenly Jerusalem. Right. You know, and that's, that's what we need to see. Pope Benedict loves to, to cite the example of Paul Claudel, the famous, uh, famous French poet who experienced an overwhelming conversion. He was an atheist, an, an unbeliever, uh, who decided one Christmas to go to midnight mass at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. He just, out of curiosity, kind of vain curiosity, and, 
And he went there, and, and by the end of that service, he was a Catholic. He said, I, I was a Catholic, and I've never ceased to believe from that moment onwards. Right. So it was the, but it was the beauty of the liturgy, he said, mm -hmm. that was what penetrated his heart mm -hmm. and converted him. And I know, actually, I know quite a few conversion stories like that, where people walking so into the, the Brompton Oratory in London and hearing Palestrina's Missa Papi Marcelli or something being sung by the choir there, they just had to sit down, and they didn't know what was being sung, they didn't know why, but they, they thought, the angels are singing, you know, the, yeah. the kingdom of heaven has come to earth, right? The professor who taught me rabbinics when I was in graduate school used to check out in the newspapers uh, which masses were being sung at which churches when he lived in Vienna. And he would just go to, to and he wasn't Catholic, never became a Catholic, but he knew this was the tremendous beauty mm -hmm. and it was a beautiful music that the church gave away. All the times you have to pay to go to a concert hall. Mm -hmm. yeah, the church yeah. gave this away. It, it was there for anybody to come exactly. and worship God and be lifted up. Yes, I, I, I heard a, a Cardinal Burke once told a story about uh, a, a pontifical liturgy he was asked to celebrate in Spain. And um, the organizers of it told him that they were going to drive a few busloads of homeless people to this liturgy. And he was a little bit surprised. He thought, well, why are, why are you doing that? Why, why, why would they be interested in a solemn pontifical liturgy? You know, it's in Latin, it's full of chants, it's two hours long. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they all came and afterwards, they, he said they, they thanked him more profusely than anyone else. They had, some of them had tears in their eyes. And they, they said, we have never seen something as beautiful as this. It's, it's you know, the, 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 the riches of the church are for everybody. Yeah, Everybody. exactly. You know that anybody can walk. Some people have said to me, well, why doesn't the Pope just sell the Michelangelo and give all the money to the poor? <laughs> well, as it is, you know, Michelangelo's Pieta is there for any of the poor to come and see. Mm -hmm. If he sells it, some rich guy keeps it in his house. Yes. yes. And this is where the same with our music. And I... Uh, there's a good point, too. I don't know if you know the book, Why Catholics Can't Sing. Yes, Thomas Day. Yeah, Thomas Day. And one of the points he makes about the use of chant is that it's a humble kind of music. Mm -hmm. You're not a virtuoso. You don't mm -hmm. have to be an mm -hmm. opera star mm -hmm. in fact, to do would, chant. In, in fact, singing chant in an operatic style would ruin it. Yeah. Uh, because it's, 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 it's originally, in its origins, it's, it's mostly monastic. Yeah. Um, it, it's it, monastic and also developed in cathedral churches where canons were celebrating the liturgy together. And it's, it, many, many chants are very easy to sing, very singable. The, the right. melodies are, are quite natural and, mm -hmm. and they grow on you. And you, you know what? The amazing thing about chant is you never get tired of singing it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think perhaps if one only used <clears throat> forever and ever maybe maybe you know a little bit of variation is a good thing that's why we have so many different masses but but I, th I think that in general the chant is a music that it's so it's so peaceful and so contemplative and so perfectly suited to the nature of the liturgy that you can lose yourself in it and in a sense rest you can it's it's a it's a restful thing well that's even why you know the spanish monks who did some albums of chant, just called chant, mm -hmm. became a, a bestseller That's true. because it was a, a music that you know calmed people and mm -hmm. and and elevated them, and they, and that was just popular music, yes. uh, it, a popular, it, uh, uh, yeah. sold album. But it was right. chant, and it had that humility of giving yourself to the music rather than exalting yourself yes. to the music. Yes, well, and, and that is actually a problem that Pope Pius X, uh, back in 1903, in his first papal document, the, the document on sacred music, Trilus Lucitudini, he, he complained about the state of church music in 1903. His problem wasn't the pseudo-folk rock pop style that we have to deal with nowadays sometimes. His problem was uh, second-rate Italian operatic music um, mm -hmm. invading the church. And, yeah. and so having this the, the operatic diva, you know, singing the Magnificat, repeating the words over and over again uh, in a kind of Puccini style or something. Mm -hmm. This is what Pius X was concerned about. But his, his concern was the same as the Council of Trent's and the same as, as we've seen with Pope Benedict XVI, namely taking a secular form of entertainment, which is fine in its own sphere or might be fine in its own sphere, and, and letting it invade and, in a sense, take over the church and turn the church into a place of entertainment and a place of business. And we know what our Lord did with the uh, money changers in the temple, right? Mm -hmm. He was not pleased with that. No. Yeah. Well, so we don't want opera. 
but we don't want you know rock and roll. What we want is music that lifts us up. We have to take a little bit of a break. Um, we want to have your questions and your comments, as well as those of our studio audience, so please stay with us. We want to go right to some of our questions here. Let's start off with a caller. Are you ready for questions? Yes, Come absolutely. on. Let's start off with Sylvia. Sylvia, where are you calling from? Good evening, Father. I'm calling from Miami, Florida. Great. And, and before your question? I say my, ask my question, I have to thank you. You were instrumental in my husband's conversion. Oh, well, yes, praise and he God died for of that. Yes, in December, so I have to thank you. Oh, you're what welcome. I, concerning the music... I am uh, really at a loss, Father, because music has taken over the mass, all these new beats and stuff. And, and it's not enticing for meditation or, or following the correct meaning of the prayer, like the Agnus Dei, and they say in a way that you would, it would be, it's a beat instead of a lament and an appreciation of the Lord. And at the end... It's a show, and people, and people clap, and there's a priest sitting down waiting for the show to end. So I wonder if the College of Bishops is looking up again the situation of the music in the, in the church in the United States. Thank you, Sylvia. Great, great question. Yes. Um, I mean, everything that Sylvia is saying is, is true. Um, uh, th there, there has been a tendency to... There's been a great disconnect between the meaning of the words in in the mass and the style of music used to illustrate those. It really doesn't. They don't fit together. There's a there's a true disjunct there. Well, I um, remember that there was a polka mass. Yes, uh, it well, used yes. the words of mass, but to a polka beat yes. within the court. Now, I love polka music. I love but it for a dance. But you know, that's at weddings. Yes, exactly. You know? So, so the, the 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 church has already said a great deal about this subject. We have many popes who've written clear instructions, clear explanations, and unfortunately the problem is it's not being implemented, it's not being followed, and I think that that has a lot to do with a lack of education, a lack of understanding. Liturgical mm -hmm. formation is not at a very high level, unfortunately, it seems to me. Um, no. But this, this point is important, and Cardinal Sara has been really emphasizing this uh, in a huge way for several years now. The importance of silence, sacred silence. Um, the liturgy naturally has, the Western liturgy, not so much the Eastern liturgies, but the Western liturgy has evolved in such a way that it, na it has natural spaces of silence in it. Uh, and those should be respected, those should be, those should be honored, because we need time um, to absorb the meaning of the mysteries and, and to pray. And I think that's, that's very precious. And, and even with the best sacred music in the world, one should not think that, that they need to fill up every minute with music. That's a mistaken notion. Yeah, that, I remember once having, you know, we just finished purifying the sacred vessels after communion, and I sat in the, the presider's chair, was waiting for a few minutes of silence, and all of a sudden, the choir, uh, or the organist, cranked up this loud song, told everybody to stand up, said, give him a chance to be yes. with Jesus. Yes, exactly. You need to be, with, you know, you just yes. received Christ. You need to make a thanksgiving and yes. just 
talk like a yes. friend to a friend. Now, I, I just want to add too that I think that the, the older styles of sacred music, what we call traditional sacred music, which the exemplar of which is Gregorian chant, but also Renaissance polyphony, um, these are styles of music that in a, in a strange sort of way, as you listen to them, they have silence built into them. They, they emerge from silence and they're, 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 they collaborate with silence. That is, they're not antagonistic to meditation, okay. but they actually support meditation, at, at least if they're well done. I mean, they do have to be well done. They, if, if they're done badly, anything done badly is distracting. Yeah. That's, right. that's what, yeah. Sir, where are you from? First of all, you're, you're not a priest yet. No, I'm not. I'm just a seminarian. Uh, well, not I'm just a, a seminarian, but you are a seminarian. Yes. I'm a father of mercy. Uh, uh, okay, yes. but you're not a father yet. Not yet, All just right. a brother. You're sort of a pre-father. <laughs> so what you got? Well, you talked earlier about sacred space, the beauty of the liturgy, the beauty of music, and the beauty of art. And I was wondering if you have a criteria to make judgments upon that, because obviously there's some music some things that should be left in the secular work in order to keep the sacred space sacred. And so I was wondering, maybe you could expand upon that. Yes, sure. thank you. Thank A you. Great very question. Much. Yeah. Um, Pope Pius X in Trellis Licitudini, that's the 1903 uh, document on sacred music, he, he actually outlines, he makes a very careful argument about the three qualities that music needs to have in order to be sacred. He says that it needs to be um, it needs to be holy in its, in its spirit, its feel. I think some of that is by association and by tradition. Um, he says that it needs to be artistically excellent. It has to have good form. So it, has, it, it, it can't be cheap. It can't be poorly, execute, poorly written and poorly executed. And the third criterion is it has to be um, universal, by which he goes on to mean that anybody who listens to this music should know that they're listening to uh, music for the mass and should be um, should be improved or elevated by that in their worship of God. Um, I think it's true that there's obviously within those three criteria there's some room for variation otherwise we wouldn't have this huge history of sacred music that we have with so many thousands of masterpieces and and lots of different styles but fundamentally these characteristics do carry through all the way from chant through to, you know Palestrina, Josquin, Palestrina, Bird into um, into more modern composers who are writing in a, in a way that's, that's in continuity with those composers. Um, so yeah, I think there are definitely criteria. And pragmatically speaking, um, the proof is in the pudding. That is to say, most people recognize a beautiful church and can distinguish it from an ugly church. Um, there might be some borderline cases, but generally speaking, you go into a cathedral, as millions of pilgrims do every year, and you just say, wow. This is the temple of God. This is the house of the Almighty. I mean, this, you know, it, it just it humbles you and it, with its beauty, right? And if you go into a barren, whitewashed, rectangular, angular kind of space uh, with no sacred art and whatever and, and, and a table, and you say, this isn't a church. This is a, this is a, a, a jet Japanese you know, tea house. Yeah, a jet propulsion laboratory or something like that. You know? well, it's, well, the reason I mentioned Japanese tea house, the, the, uh, in the book uh, by Michael Rose called Ugly as Sin. Yes. Uh, he brings out that one of the popular church architects of preceding decades had m used the Japanese tea house, mm -hmm. which is part of a Zen Buddhist yes. religious expression. Yeah. Emptying in out. Which you're, yeah. which you're trying yeah. to enter into the emptiness. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they were using that as a model for churches. Right, right. No, and, and our religion is, is a religion of the word made flesh. It's a religion of fullness and a religion of, of um, sanctified matter. That's what Christ our Lord does. He sanctifies the flesh. Um, and therefore, the beautiful in Christianity is not some kind of extraneous or incidental category. Um, the beautiful is actually the splendor of the truth. It's the splendor of the truth of who God is. God is supreme beauty. Everything that he makes in nature is beautiful as well. And the, the goal of architecture is to lift up your yes. mind toward heaven. And having all these saints, whether it's icons in the East mm -hmm. or statues among Westerners, stained to remind you, uh, stained glass among Westerners, which are icons in glass, you know, either way, the mm -hmm. idea is to remind you, these are all the saints. It's mm -hmm. like you're mm -hmm. entering into heaven. Yes. And not just you know, continuing on into the emptiness. Yes, and if, if I could just add one last point. Um, I said earlier that the principle of tradition 
is crucial for answering any of these questions. That is, we can't answer the question of what should a church look like or what should church music sound like in the abstract, um, in, a, in a sort of philosophical way where we just sit down and we figure it all out on our own, like a mathematical problem. We have to look to tradition. That's our, the Holy Spirit um, governs the church throughout the ages and leads the church into the fullness of truth. And that fullness of truth includes the fullness of the expression of the beauty of the faith. Mm -hmm. So something like Romanesque architecture, Gothic architecture, uh, Renaissance architecture, Baroque architecture, each in its own way is a revelation of the splendor of the truth. And therefore, a modern church architect, when he sits down, he doesn't just sit down to a blank piece of paper. He needs to look at examples from the past mm -hmm. and ask, how am I in continuity with this great heritage? Of course, you can't have a church that's all at once, Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance, Baroque, right? You can't just mish, you know, mishmash them it's together. It's Mr. Potato Head. No, it's not. But, but you still have to look at, there are templates of what has been successful in, um, in sort of embodying the liturgy and, and the, the, the principles of, of the church. So yeah. that's... We have Rena on the line. Hello, Rena. Hi, Father. Where yeah, are you calling I'm, from? Uh, San Diego, Father. Oh, great, yes. great. I, I worked with the liturgical director here with the parishes, and uh, sang, I accompanied her on the organ when she sang, Oh, yes, my, my Lord liveth. I know my Lord liveth from the Messiah, you know, on Easter. Mm -hmm. And I remember that some of the beautiful hymns in English, one of them was Come to the Water, which is very beautiful. I don't think we need to throw out those hymns, you know. No, no, I no, if they're beautiful, keep them. Sure, exactly. But, if, but here's the hymns that I want to throw out. The ones that are talking about us instead of worshiping God. The hymns that say how great I am instead of saying to God how great you are. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and there are a lot of hymns that are egomania for the whole congregation mm -hmm. telling God how lucky you are, Lord, that I came to church today. So pay attention and listen up. Those are the kind of hymns I want out and worship of God in beautiful hymns. Those we keep. Father, can I make a comment sure. about the Latin? Sure. That, uh, the Latin was, you know, I'm a Latin professor, also a teacher in high school, and, you know, it, uh, if, if it was so great to translate the Latin, you know, uh, like Peter says, if we were so right doing that, why did we have to go through a series of translations? You remember the first response to uh, Dominus Fobisco, and the Lord be with you, was, and, and also with you. Now it's not. It changed again. They went back, and I used to say, well, that's not what it says. You know, it says it with your spirit, and they went back to it again. Mm -hmm. Some things just can't be translated, you know, and we, we need to leave. That's one of the reasons we need to leave the Latin alone, and it would be good to have the Latin back in church. You know, my piano teacher used to say, you know, the Chopin's revolutionary etude, don't play that, because unless you play it like Horowitz, don't do it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, the, and some of the, some of the, so I think it's wonderful. Now we say we use, they use the supine, source some corda, you know, let, let, lift it up as to the hearts and all that. That's fine. People understand that. The Spanish in church understand that. People understand Latin. Mm -hmm. You know, Stabat Mater, Dolorosa, you know, Black Rimosa. People can, can get it. And it's so much better instead of tr to con trying to get these contrived translations yeah. Yeah. that make no sense. Like, how do you translate Panis Angelicus? Heavenly bread or um, angel bread, angel food, like angel food cake as opposed to devil's food cake. You know, it gets, uh, it gets kind, of, kind of silly. Everything this she's sounds saying like a true. Latin teacher who's done it a few semesters. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, what she's saying is perfectly true. We, we, we have a heritage of Latin hymns and chants. They belong to us. They're, they're, they're actually the most beautiful, some of the most beautiful music ever written. If you take any standard textbook of music history and you read the section about the Middle Ages, it will say these thousands of Gregorian melodies are among the most beautiful melodies ever written. That's I mean, right. everybody agrees with that. Even the yeah. secular, the professionals can see that, right? That's mm -hmm. why these chant CDs are so popular, because it is beautiful music. Why, why, wouldn't we, why wouldn't the church for the new evangelization take a cue from the New York Times bestseller list or, or, or the uh, record, whatever the record equivalent is of billboard. that. The billboard list, you know. Uh, it's, it's something I've often asked myself. Yeah, yeah I, and I think, you know, again, with some of these hymns, one of the reasons they don't work when you translate them into English is because it's not only that it's Latin with its own meter and such mm -hmm. that it's made for that music, mm -hmm. but 
English has a different set of sounds, yes. a different relationship yes. between exactly. vowels and consonants, Precisely. and some, some of our uh, diphthongs, mm -hmm. like the TH sound and PH sound, are, you know, are lengthened in a way that yes. doesn't fit Latin. I, I have to, you have to yeah. use Latin exactly. words for Latin-made melodies. I mean, I, I will say on the one hand, that in recent years there have been some of the most successful attempts to date of English chant, English plain chant. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, one one uh, master of that genre is Father Samuel Weber, who works uh, out in San Francisco uh, for the Benedict XVI Institute. Um, and he has produced a whole book called The Proper of the Mass for Sundays and Solemnities. It's published by Ignatius Press. And it, it has hundreds of chants based on the Gregorian melodies, but all with the English texts from mm -hmm. the Roman Missal. Mm -hmm. And they are mostly very successful. I mean, I, I find them easy to sing. Oh, I've good. used them at Mass uh, mm -hmm. many times when I, when I do the choir for the ordinary form. Um, but they are always, they're never as, they're always a little bit awkward. They're, they're never as, cl as clear and, and fluent as the Latin original right. chant, even at their best. Um, and he's explained to me before, this is precisely because of how, how the differences between English and Latin. Yeah. Um, and my scola, of, I have a scola of college students. Sometimes, we, most of the time we sing in Latin. Sometimes we sing in English. And, and it's funny, the reactions I get from the college um, uh, fellows, they say, oh, do we have to sing in English? It's so much easier to sing in Latin. Yeah. You know? Well, and one of the other things, too, though, is it is possible to do chants for English language that are not the Latin chants, yes. the Gregorian chants. You can do chants that fit the English yes, then, style. Exactly. And, you know, for instance, the Benedictine monks up in Coleman, Alabama, are working on that, and mm -hmm. they're being very, very successful and very beautiful in some of their English. So it can be done for yes. English, yes. but some things... Uh, certain I, I times the chants yeah. fit Latin, just like a lot of German hymns mm -hmm. sound better in German. Right, you know, they, right. they just have a great resonance yes. in German. Father, where are you from? Madison, Georgia. Welcome. Well, and what you. is your question? My question is, uh, I guess it's because of cultural considerations or whatever. So many people come to Mass, and I think it's natural based on our culture, but they expect more of an entertainment experience, whether like a TV experience or a concert experience mm -hmm. or something like that. How can we help people see that Mass is a completely different thing, that it really is, uh, uh, it's praise of God and it's being elevated to the divine and encountering the divine and giving him the praise that is due because of his goodness. Thank you, Father. That's a great question. Um, I think one thing we haven't really talked about much yet, we've been talking a lot about Latin and about chant. Um, so first of all, and very obviously, if we use Gregorian chants, at least simple ones, and if we, or, or even English plain chant, and if we use some Latin in the liturgy, this already sends a signal to people that this is not your everyday occasion, and you shouldn't expect to have the same uh, feelings and the same outcome. Uh, it's not a party, it's not a concert, um, it's not a social gathering. It's, I mean, it, it is a social gathering, but it's essentially the sacrifice of the Mass that our Lord is, is allowing us to participate in, and it's only because we participate in it with, through Him that we're united to each other. So it's social by consequence, by overflow, not by, you know. Um, but, but I, I think what we haven't talked about are some of the other elements that ought to be present in the, in the liturgy. For example, the vestments used should be beautiful. The priests, the chasuble should be a beautiful, dignified um, chasuble that, that is, is, is awesome in a certain sense. It, this is the vestment of the high priest. Um, uh, that the incense should be used because the moment that the incense is used and the clouds of it are rising, you have to get an uh, an altar boy who really knows how to get that charcoal going, otherwise you don't. But you, when you have the clouds of incense rising and the whole church is, is filled with that fragrance, it's really obvious that you're, you're setting about divine worship. And I, I'm astonished as I've traveled at how few ordinary form parishes or, or, or communities use incense. It's, mm -hmm. like, it's like it's just sort of disappeared except on, at Christmas and Easter, you know. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a mistake. I think, why not every, every high mass, yeah. every Sunday mass, there should yeah. be incense. You know, that makes a big difference. So it, it sets, and it sets the Sunday mass exactly. apart from the daily mass cycle. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it makes it something extra uh, important. Um, I, I think, you know, I mean, here I'm going to go out on a limb a bit more, uh -oh. um, certainly with, with regard to the ordinary form. But I think that, you know, something like encouraging women to take up again the practice of wearing a veil at Mass, which is something that we see a lot in extraordinary form communities, but we don't see that so much yet in ordinary form communities. Um, that also sends a message to the woman herself and to everyone around that this is a special time. This is a time of prayer. Leave me alone. Don't bother me. You know, th this is a time for prayer, and let's, we're not going to have a lot of chit-chat 
before Mass and, and after Mass and so on. This is a time for prayer. Um, I think that's important. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's starting to think along the lines of what are all the customs or practices that are available to us in our Catholic tradition that can all send the signal that this is divine worship and it's about God, it's not about us um, or about any aesthetic experience that we might have. You're always going to have the risk of some people who take it as who take beautiful music as a concert, but I don't think that should be a reason for avoiding beautiful music. I just think mm -hmm. that you need to also educate people to recognize that we're offering this beauty as a gift. We're, we're, it's like we're giving this offering to the Lord. Um, it's not just for our entertainment, right? So there's yeah. always gonna be that danger, I think. But one thing you said at the beginning of, of your answer I want to highlight. If people don't understand that this is the representation of Christ's death on Calvary mm -hmm. and the celebration of his resurrection and entrance into the mystery mm -hmm. of his death and resurrection. If you don't see that and you make this all about yourself, mm -hmm. of course your hymns will be about yourself. Mm -hmm. you need, we need to have that emphasis that it's Jesus Christ we are coming to meet at Mass mm -hmm. and we get to know each other too, but we are not the main attraction. Yes, exactly. Jesus Christ is the main attraction, and that must be the center. Yes. Amen. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Originally from Cleveland. Aren't you something? And so what is your question? I'll make it a quick question, but it won't be a quick answer. Unfortunately, not much time left. But uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the differences between the old Mass and the new Mass as far as the prayers, if you were to objectively compare them side by side and perhaps the advantages or disadvantages of sure. each? Uh, you can't do that it, prayer by prayer, but give me a cut. It, you know, he's part it, of it. Exactly. It's a, it's a long answer. But, um, but to put it briefly, I mean, I, I think what we saw in the liturgical reform in the 1960s, and this has been admitted by, by Joseph Ratzinger, by Cardinal Sarah, by others, uh, we saw um, a somewhat hasty reform and a, a very um, even brutal reform in the sense in which so many elements were quickly taken away uh, and, and taken away without a sufficient thinking through of why they were there to begin with. Right. So I think w the main thing you see when you just put the ordinary form and the extraordinary form next to each other as far as their texts are concerned, there are obviously other questions, ceremonial questions, but if you just put the text next to each other, the ordinary form is much, much shorter. Um, the offertory prayers are gone, the prayers at the foot of the altar, Psalm 42, the second confitior at the beginning, uh, the last gospel at the end. Um, and in, a, in, in various respects, there's a kind of um, uh, a removal of some of that dense saturation of prayer that accumulated over many centuries. And for the people who did that, they, they wanted to clean the decks. They thought, oh, this is too dense, this is too saturated. Um, for those of us who really love the extraordinary form, we say, no, no, this is the way that, that liturgy ought to be. Liturgy ought to be um, uh, a complex web of many different prayers, some of which don't even neatly fit together because we're dealing with a mystery here, an incomprehensible mystery. We will never understand fully the mystery of the Mass. Uh, and there's something, mm -hmm. I think, about the extraordinary form that really brings home that the priest, in fear and trembling, is going up to the altar to offer a sacrifice. And that, I think, is, is, is crucial. It's crucial to recover that across the church. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. I have one more question here. Sir, where are you from? Fernando, Florida. Aren't you something? And what is your question? Are all seminarians today required to learn Latin before ordination? Good question. Okay, now I, I can't answer your question factually in the sense that I don't know what each seminary requires around the country. I can't. But I, I, I do know, I do know. The answer to that is no. I do know that canon law, canon law, 1983 Code of Canon Law, explicitly requires that all clergy uh, be familiar with Latin. It actually uses this term. I, I, it, I forget the Latin term, but it's, it's, a, it's stronger than just that you glanced your eyes over it once or twice. It actually means that you have to have, I think it's, you have to have competency in Latin is what the code of canon law requires. Um, and again, that, that seems to me to be, it, it's an outrageous um, lack that, that so I know many seminaries say, um, you know, our clergy, especially in this country, they have, they need to learn Spanish. Um, and in some cases they need to improve their English as well. How can we teach them so many languages? But if the Roman Catholic clergy are not learning Latin, they are being cut off 
from 1,500 years of their church's history and tradition. Mm -hmm. That's a serious problem. That's just as serious a problem as not being able to hear uh, a confession in Spanish or something like that. I think yeah. you need both. You have to have both. You have to take take seriously that the that the priesthood has an intellectual component to it, and uh, and that's what we need. Yeah, to, uh, and when we were in minor seminary, it was four years of Latin and two years of a modern language, mm -hmm. as well as four years of English. Again, we want to encourage you to get uh, the uh, his book. Uh, Dr. Kvasniewski's book is Resurgent in the Midst of Crisis, Sacred Liturgy, the Traditional Latin Mass and Renewal in the Church. Get that at EWTN's Religious Catalog, is item 80870. He's got a brand new book coming out. It's not even hot off the press. It's still on the press. So it's hot, but it's on the press. It's Noble Beauty, Transcendent Holiness. So that's coming out next week. That's right. Yeah, so you just got all these hits coming. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. And I want to give you a blessing. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, we can offer Mass to you each day with some beautiful singing there. And we can bring guests who can talk about elevating us and all the other topics and shows that we have for one reason only because this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible with your donations, and especially in the summertime before you go on vacation and when you come back. Keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you. <laughs>